So, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Grammar. I'm also known as uh, Vadim Zaitsev, and I'm the second author of the, uh, of the paper. The first author is Nicole Bavrova, who has been a, a student at the University of Amsterdam, and she's done this wonderful uh, master project. So, uh, most of the like really, uh, really fun work in the project belongs to her, and I was the one who came up with the idea but didn't have enough time to, uh, to do it myself, so I stuck to uh, you know, supervision and occasionally doing some useful stuff. So, uh, in case you're bored after a long day, or uh, I know I don't have enough Haskell to uh, uh, to entertain you, uh, look at the pictures of pythons. I've, I've put a lot of effort into putting pythons, the appropriate, slight appropriate pythons for, uh, for the presentation. Right. So, and this is uh, uh, this represents Java. If you don't know this, visit uh, visit Belgian museums that are in uh, Gibraltar. They have a lot of uh, this kind of cool stuff. Uh, right. So, um, uh, programming. Uh, so, I will talk about. I will not talk about programming as such. I will talk about programming languages. Programming languages. So, um, you know, using the the. Um, the paradigm of yesterday that we all should do, you know, the life and, and literate uh, things. I will be very uh, uh, liberal and very, you know, I will try to change some things, even in the name of the conference that I'm presenting it. So, uh, in order to explain myself, I will refer to the changed title of the conference. Uh, because, you know, it's, it's uh, art, science and engineering, but science means two things, right? So, uh, it, it's also in the call. So it's science, like uh, you know, you, you devise a theory and you do something, and science is in you do the you do the experiment and then you play with the hypothesis and you do a lot of uh, box plots. Uh, so the the art for for programming languages means you know language design, compiler design, anything that uh, you know has some uh, architectural uh, consequences, not in only in a technical sense, but also in a sense of uh, you know how it. Uh, uh, how it appears to the user. What kind of community do you create by uh, by putting certain uh, things there? How do you how do you connect to the people? How do you create the right practices, the right behaviors in the users of uh, your language? That's what's interesting there for me. Uh, then for the theory, you know, we have tons of uh, uh, stuff like formal language theory, Parsons schemata, a lot of uh, calculi for. Uh, um, for uh, I don't know, type theory, uh, some stuff for bidirectional transformations and whatnot. Uh, for science, well, we have uh, also uh, recent, since recently, a lot of things with fuzzing uh, with test data generation is something that allows us to do cool stuff with. Uh, oh, you know, uh, something that we've done uh, here as well. Let's take a bunch of code and let's throw it at our tool and let's see if it breaks. Oh, it breaks. Okay, we fix the thing and then we we go back. Um, uh, and then for the engineering, you know, that's the compiler construction and uh, parsing techniques. How do you connect all these bits together and, and stuff like this? So this was the, the uh, uh, fun part for me. Again, this is the first author. And this is the second author. That's uh, uh, that's me. So if you want to know what's in the paper, read the paper. The paper is online. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. Uh, uh, it's uh, you know. Uh, you've already heard enough praise for the uh, journal and for the people who made it possible. Uh, so um, this presentation will be a slight reframing of the things that are there. You know, I, I didn't I didn't change the facts that are in the, in the paper, but I've uh, put them in a slightly different perspective so that it, you have a chance to see why I care about this. I, I I'm not claiming that you would start to care about this, but this you would you would feel some empathy for why I care. So I'm using the framework that was proposed in the call for papers for the, the you know, context and, and uh, whatnot. So the context for this thing is software language engineering. This is what, what's interesting for me. So what software language engineering? Some uh, people know about this. Some people have even I have seen a software language engineering conference. Some of you share the conference. Um, and uh, so the software language engineering is the paradigm of uh, you know doing fun stuff with languages, but going beyond programming languages. So going for all these wonderful things like forced generation languages on mainframe that I talked a lot about uh, with some people during the last days. Domain specific languages, domain specific aspect languages that, that we've had at the very beginning of the conference. Modeling markup, I don't know, uh, blameless type systems and whatnot. It's going beyond just grammars. Grammars in the narrow sense, the, 
that you know the, go into a yuck and then you get your tree or maybe you don't uh, maybe it's stuck in, 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 in uh, some some uh, intricate part of the parsing algorithm. Uh, but parsing in a broad sense and grammars also in a broad sense. Today, Boz is looking at me right now. She's she's gave, uh, she, uh, he gave a talk uh, where he gave he gave a very uh, bold statement that uh, web applications are actually languages. So uh, there there was some discussion on Twitter uh, uh, from Marcus Fulda. But uh, you know, in general, uh, they are definitely can be seen as languages in a sense that you can apply some techniques known from languages in uh, uh, in that. And you know, XML command or whatever. And it goes beyond compilers. So it's it, and it's not just a, it's not just compilers. It's also pretty printers. No, it's it's uh, it's also uh, parameters with their context. You know the the uh, uh, the art and science and and whatnot. So you know there are communities where it's uh, traditional to format your program before you commit. And if you start introducing it to Java, you, you will have a revolution in your hands. And but in in other communities it works. Uh, but also, you know, IDEs, deep integration with, with all kinds of components, giving support to, to something that uh, uh, Simon just said, you know, give, not doing the magic yourself, but give, doing the little things to help people do the complex things with, uh, with your language. And in general, the, the coolest part there is what is also the inquiry here. It's a language agnostic and language parametric methods. Right? We want something that is portable from one language, from one area to, uh, uh, to another. And, and sometimes it's really like it's, uh, uh, it's two. So uh, in, uh, since you know, recently we have, at least since recently we have the term, uh, uh, but we definitely have quite a few of the language work uh, benches. So, you know, you want to create language, here's the thing. You know, download it, install it, and it's, uh, uh, it works, and you can, you can play around, and you can have your, uh, your language there. Uh, usually these things kind of enforce their, their own view of the world, so they uh, enforce you to, uh, to design a language, to develop it in a particular paradigm, and um, uh, whatnot. Uh, what definitely uses, uh, you know, works across languages is metrics calculation, especially simple metrics. So you know, if you want to know how many lines of code are in your in your code and you don't care about the empty lines, well, you do WC minus L, and there you, go. you have developed your first language agnostic uh, program. Uh, you then you start playing with pipelines and sets to to uh, uh, grab minus V to uh, get out the empty lines, and then it gets slightly complicated. So you know, sometimes you know there is a uh, there is a suspicion that it works only for, uh, for simple cases. And of course, there is language modularizations. There have been uh, some interesting talks here and at, uh, uh, at collocated events about how to embed one language into uh, into another. So how to you know use the macros, use some some other approaches, use language boxes, anything. Uh, but what uh, what I wanted to do here is to take uh, to take some kind of high level technique. So in this case, defect detection, uh, and uh, deep by defect, you know, again, it's a term. I didn't coin it. I don't want to say that it's a bad thing, the, the, something that's identified with a defect. But this this is a term. Usually, it's a term for uh, things like uh, code smells, anti patterns, and uh, other things that are bad-ish, right? So they they, they look uh, uh, they look not good, and they you you kind of by identifying them you encourage the programmer to uh, uh, look at these pieces of code and to see uh, okay is is there actually a defect? If there is a defect, is it defect on architecture level or is it is a bad code or you know anything? So we've taken a high-level technique and we've reapplied it to a fundamentally different language. So I've Googled around what, uh, you know, what are the differences between Java and Python? And, then, you know, uh, and uh, nothing good came out. You know, there, there are tons of blog posts that say, oh, you know, but one is statically typed, one is dynamically typed, and then kind of uh, it, it goes downwards from there. And, and, uh, uh, and yes, this is true. Java is a statically typed language, and Python is a dynamically typed language. But it's also, uh, you know, it, the distinction is not just Java is heavy on curlies and Python uses the indentation, uh, which is quite relevant for parsing, for instance. But it's also, it's the entire, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
um, tradition, it's the entire paradigm of developing any language. If you're developing a Java program, then uh, you know you you write in a lot of code right away. You start with with your architecture, and before you know, before you've written even one line of code that matters, you have already had uh, uh, twenty classes all in the separate files, of course, and then you've, uh, you, you, can, you have an opportunity to do like 10 commits before you've written anything uh, of substance. In Python it goes the other way, it's the other extreme. You start writing a script, it's a file, you don't, you don't have a structure, it's, it's a thing that uh, basically says that you're too lazy to write a complex set statement or uh, a regular expression. And then you go from there, it, it uh, uh, goes bigger and bigger, One, at some point you uh, recognize the need of functions, you define a few functions, then you start working uh, uh, functionally-ish, uh, more like uh, in a mix of uh, functional imperative. And then once you want to uh, solidify whatever it is you develop, <coughs> then you do uh, the classes. And these things, they make huge impact on the structure of the code and on the way we uh, write the code. So, that is why it's interesting to see, you know, can I take something that exists in the Java world and just boldly reapply it into uh, in, in, in Python? What will happen? And both languages matter, right? So everybody here likes to the TOB index, so it's number one and number five. I will let you guess which one is which. Uh, so the knowledge, and not the Pythons. Uh, uh, so the reuse is possible to, to make to make the uh, the short answer. So this is a table that we also have uh, somewhere in the paper, and we've identified a few uh, few defects that were already published, were already documented, were already specified somewhere. Sometimes even had an implementation, and then we would uh, we would go uh, and and, uh, and reuse it. So um, for feature NB and data class, we uh, we don't have a point of comparison because the tool that we've chosen to uh, to compare to didn't uh, use. But for long method, for instance. We had nice comparison, and we always uh, like to put uh, this here to say that you know we've tested it on 30 million lines of code just as you know as a way of uh, of reminding you how, how awesome this is. Uh, but look at the bold numbers. Look at the density columns. Right, it, the density in Decor, with Decor was applied in Java, and DDD was applied in Python. So Java is on the right, Python's on the left. Uh, the density is like twice as high. Why is this the case? This is a long method. So um, you know, you've just heard uh, talk about how it is, how important it is to you know have the threshold set right. So instead of setting thresholds, we have used uh, uh, statistical uh, uh, measurement. So instead of saying, oh, long method is anything that's larger than twenty lines, we would say, okay, statistically, what kind of methods do you have? And anything that's an extreme outlier on the heavy uh, side, that's a long method. The, the number nine in, in the paper, what means extreme. So why is it so that in, in Python we have much, much more uh, long methods? Well, if you Google around what is a long method, then mostly you will find people wondering why the hell long methods are considered a bad smell in the first place. There are, there are people uh, uh, writing blog posts, but there are also like, serious people writing, uh, writing books. We've heard from Matthew that uh, nobody reads blogs. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm not sure what kind of claim we should we should make about books, but it's for for a different uh, discussion. Uh, but uh, it's uh, um, uh, so it is the opinion of quite a lot of programmers that long methods are okay. And besides this, again, we're using uh, uh, we're using statistical things, which means if you have a Python class and it has tons of methods that are one-liners. Well, good luck writing a one-liner in Java. So there, you will you will probably have uh, somewhere around I don't know five ten uh, lines in in any case. In uh, Python, it's quite easy to have uh, tons of methods that are one-liners, and then you write one which is I don't know ten lines, and voila, it is an uh, it is an extreme outlier. So for long parameter list, uh, we have uh, much lower density. Much lower density. So long parameter list means that you know you have you have a list of parameters that goes on and on and on. And um, I didn't have good uh, good explanation for this, but indeed I looked at at the uh, at my Python code. I've been using Python for I know uh, almost 20 years. Very 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 uh, scary thing to say. Uh, 
but uh, and, and most of the time, yeah, you have you have just a few things in the uh, in the arguments, and um, I don't know why why is that? Maybe it has something to do with uh, uh, typing, and maybe it has something to do with the fact that you know if you want to, to bundle things together, it's quite easy uh, to do. But I don't know. But the difference is there. Uh, for a large class, well, the uh, it, the, uh, the density is approximately the same. So, uh, yeah, somebody is enjoying my Python's. Good. My, my PowerPoint slides are now 35 megabytes. So, you know. I, I was sliding to the point that it took you like eight minutes before the first Python appeared, but now it's good. Before the second Python. Oh, you oh you come from zero. Sorry, you're a programmer. <laughs> Right, so for the God class, and if, if you, uh, so there is a my mythological Python, and this is uh, this is the one. Uh, the mythologi this is where, when uh, the, the case where um, metaphors don't get you that far. So the mythological Python was living in Delphi. The, the programming language Python has nothing to do with Delphi, except for some Pascal influence. Uh, right, so God class, almost uh, almost no uh, God classes. Why is that? Well, of course, I don't know, but I have a very good explanation. And a very good explanation is, if you wanted to make a class that does everything, you wouldn't make it a class in Python. Like, really, you would, you would just keep it as a function or just as a script. In Java, you don't have that luxury. So, if you're inclined to put everything in, in one place, well, you create a class and put everything in one place. Then we have a Swiss, a Swiss army knife, uh, and we have approximately the same thing, so it's boring. Functional decomposition. Uh, we found nothing. Nothing. Yes, good luck decomposing that. Um, so, uh, so what is a functional decomposition? It's basically when uh, when you have a class that's in the name there is a, a verb, like a make something, create something, and whatnot. It has no superclass and it references a lot of kind of useless classes which have only one or two methods and they have lots of private uh, uh, stuff in there. So, uh, yeah, these things apparently don't happen in Python. Why? Well, I don't know, but they don't. Uh, but my, my inner feeling tells me that something is wrong with the definition. Not wrong, wrong, but something makes the definition not apply to Python. So in Python, probably there can be also problems like you see on, on the top uh, uh, right corner, but they don't look the same way as in, uh, in Java. And then you have spaghetti code. So spaghetti code we found like one uh, thing that conforms to the definition that was found in uh, in other papers. And uh, still, you know, it's uh, it was defined as a class that has a again procedural name. The, uh, the it doesn't have a superclass. It uses globals and it has a, uh, uh, it has at least one long method. To me, it seems very cryptic and not related at all to what I would call spaghetti code. But then, what I would call spaghetti code refers to, I don't know, assembler with like lots of jumps all over the place, which also doesn't happen in, in Python. So, you know, we need we need a new uh, definition. Right. So we get to the G, and G is the grounding. So uh, the grounding was before all the fun can start. You know, I can. I can talk to you about you know what does it mean to, to have a functional decomposition and what does it mean to have everything. But before all that starts, you need to parse the damn thing. And by the damn thing, I mean something like five uh, dialects of Python that are currently in uh, in existence and in wide use. Something between Python 2.5 is still used pretty uh, uh, pretty often. 2.7 is used uh, quite often, and then there is Python 3. And the best thing about them, they are not compatible with uh, uh, with each other. But luckily, you know, there are lots of uh, compilables. You've seen these photos the last couple of weeks if you're following me on Twitter. If you don't, you should. Uh, and in that book, uh, more than compiler design, there is a, uh, a nice paper reference uh, which is called uh, Introduction to Grammar Convergence. So finally, we can uh, uh, we can uh, we can use something to uh, to consolidate several grammars of different uh, Python's. And this is what we've done. So we uh, we've taken the uh, the grammar of Python 3.3. .3, so for only one of these dialects that we wanted to support, and we put up the specification. In this case, I show the specification of 2.7, but there are also specifications of, of uh, other Python's. And you see, you know, there are some uh, uh, some differences there. 
and basically this one is written in a different notation. So we change it to the Antler notation and it's, it makes it easier to compare and easier to well, copy paste uh, uh, things from one to another. And then we have a converged grammar for the superset of both uh, things. Uh, superset in this case in the sense that you parse it as a print statement so you still know that it could be a print statement but of course if you later down the pipeline if you know that you're working with Python 3 there is no print statement so you can then uh, then flip it to, uh, to something else but that information is there so you know parsing wise it is a superset but uh, you still keep the good information in the, in the thing uh, grounding again for the nine known defects, so the defects that we've uh, uh, used. Uh, there is, a, as we have seen with the results, there is a lot to discuss and a lot to be said about the definitions of those. But the good thing, uh, we're not guilty. Uh, the definitions we've taken from, from somewhere else and we've uh, reapplied them. So by doing that, uh, we kind of shift the focus to actually trying to reapply stuff that already exists and not argue about whether the definition is good. We can make another uh, uh, project and uh, for the next programming to say, okay, what is a spaghetti code? Why, uh, why is it, uh, uh, why some people say that this is, this is spaghetti code? What uh, is it to, that makes it you know, past that one? Uh, right, and yeah, all these references, they refer to some papers, but uh, the definitions are mostly coming from books uh, like the Farlow's book on refactoring, the anti-patterns book, uh, uh, object-oriented design heuristics, and so forth. And the implementations are usually from uh, papers. Another grounding, we wanted to have a Python corpus. So we wanted to uh, try our grammar on something, something real. So we wrote a crawler uh, for uh, PyPy, which is the uh, repository for uh, Python is to, be, to put their, uh, their libraries and projects on, and uh, GitHub, with, uh, so one relates to another. And after a couple of times being banned by one or the other, because we misused the API, uh, we have finally collected uh, 4,000 uh, projects. Uh, the code of those 4,000, I mean 4,000 good projects, right? Uh, because sometimes it's a project that uh, has a little bit of Python. Uh, Linux kernel has some Python in it. Uh, but it's a, it's a script and to install something in there and obviously there's tons of C code and we don't want to, to put that as a good Python project. Uh, maybe it's good Python, I don't know. But, uh, you know. And also we are reusing definitions from Java which heavily rely on uh, the constructs being object-oriented. Obviously we want object-oriented Python code and not, uh, not functions and not, uh, uh, not scripts. So the 4,000 uh, projects that we could uh, work with 200,000 modules, 500,000 classes, and finally 32,058,823 lines of uh, uh, Python code. Isn't that great? It's a lot, in case you don't. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, the last one was I, but I didn't like the I, so it's not the influence, it's the beginning, so the, the beginning of new opportunities. So, now we have a grammar. So we can uh, we can do stuff with it. I mean, playing with the grammar is my favorite part. But now we have a grammar, we can do slightly less exciting things, like actually you know, measuring things and checking the, if the trees are correct and, and uh, uh, whatnot. And it is a grammar that was able to survive quite a lot of code. And from these thousands and thousands of modules and uh, uh, classes that I've uh, uh, shown. Um, only 300 files were uh, impossible to parse. There were some projects with like parse ratio way down the drain, we throw them away, uh, well, after development. But, uh, and, uh, but those little outliers, those little things that were unparsable, we looked at them manually and they were not accepted by Python interpreter either. So somebody corrected incorrect code. Somebody was wrong on the internet. Uh, so we also have a code model based uh, uh, defect detector. So basically it means that if somebody, like us or somebody else, will write a parser for some other language, I don't know, Java, or if you, if you so insist, Haskell, or a, a Racket, uh, and then uh, if it produces the same code model, you can just plug it in into the same tool and get, uh, get even cooler uh, results. Yes. Um, and then, of course, we can think about you know, the uh, um, 
developing and detecting uh, smells, designs, uh, design faults, uh, anti patterns, and defects of Python that are specific to Python only and are not specific to Java. Or maybe after we've developed it for Python, we can migrate it back to Java. I don't know. So uh, uh, there is related work on uh, coding conventions, uh, but in general, for instance, something like you know, if you if you write Python code with like uh, you know while loops when you introduce a temporary variable and you, you use a plus equals, then you're probably a very good C plus plus programmer or C programmer. But uh, you know, this you, this is not quality uh, C sharp code. So the, the better thing would be to have a for something in range. And uh, even better, you can use comprehensions. Even better, if you in Python 2, you can use maps and filters. In Python 3, there uh, you are slightly crippled. And you see, I've used the programming thing. Uh, uh, so unexpected related thing is RESTful. It's another language that I use for uh, uh, for prototyping things. And this is also typically something that uh, you would write uh, some code, make sure that it works, and then it, it takes a, a page, and then you, you play around with it, and then at some point it becomes a one line. So there is something uh, to see there as well. So the conclusion is you have uh, heard things about uh, what was the, the context was the first one, then it was the inquiry, then uh, I don't know, architecture or something, uh, and then it was knowledge, and then it was grounding, and it was the beginning. So you know you've heard both sides of the of the story. It depends on uh, it's up to you on which uh, which side are you. If you want to know more, read the paper. This was my co-author. These are the sources for the. Uh, he wants the CIA KGB from Twitter. Good. So uh, uh, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. And if you are on Twitter, please follow Grammar. Thank you. Once you're uh, changing something in the grammar, make a test case that uh, doesn't work, then, then change it and uh, use it uh, so it works. Uh, for the, uh, the trees for coming from this 30 million uh, lines of code, uh, we haven't checked them. So, so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a gradual process. So the first thing is to make sure that it works on a, on a small uh, scale and to make sure that the, the combination uh, works. Then try to throw a lot of things at it. And now there should be something else, if you want to pursue the correct spot. Awesome. Awesome. Um, when you did do the uh, analysis of uh, those 30 something million lines of code, 32 million 58,823 lines of code, uh, were the results uh, statistically consistent with uh, the small scale analysis that you did? Yeah. Thank you again.